Hi, gang. I thought I'd start this episode a bit differently. Instead of me blathering on about something in the shop, we're going on location to Mystic Seaport. This past August, I, along with six other craftspeople, were asked to participate in a two-day demonstration of our individual disciplines. And this was a pretty eclectic gathering, and it was really wonderful to see other people working at their passions. Now, the other perpetrators in this event were a man making Windsor and Shaker-style chairs, largely by hand. There was a carver working on a hopelessly complicated bracket. And there was also a custom furniture maker who displayed some amazing one-of-a-kind pieces. I'd never seen anything like these. And there was a fellow making Greenland paddles by hand. I didn't even know that was a thing. And there were three, yep, three ship model guys, all from the USS Constitution Model Shipwright Guild. They were Paul Desperado Schmidt and one of the club's two resident Models in Bottles guys, Alex, how did you get that in the bottle? Bellinger, and of course, uh, that guy. You know him. So before we knuckle down to our whale boat, let's take a look around the exhibits and the grounds, and this might give you some idea as to what made this such an enjoyable weekend. An old man rose from the ocean foam. He ordered John Tabor onto his boat. He said, I can take home. John Tabor climbed into that boat. They rode off toward the well. The old man's aim was fast and true. They jumped upon that well, oh boy, then tuck it down their sail. The whale swam on Barely touching the waves Past islands with no names With frightening speed Past creatures strange And volcanoes shooting flames They flew past the Fiji Islands And over the Coral Sea John Tabor clung with all his In episode six, you saw the framing process. After that, come the ceiling planks. And I did the starboard side of this boat off camera. Don't ask why, it just sort of happened and it got away from me and before I knew it, I had half the thing done and I hadn't filmed it. So we'll concentrate on this second half. Now, in order to know where the planks go, we also have to know where they don't go. So we have to establish the upper limit of where the ceiling planks are. And for that, we consult the plans. Now, the ceiling planks are capped, if you will, by the riser. And that's roughly three inches wide by three quarters inch thick. And it runs almost from one end of the boat to the other. Now, the ceiling planks are half inch cedar. So the riser stands proud by only about a quarter of an inch. So there isn't really much difference there, but it's noticeable. The distance from the top of the rail to the top of the riser remains constant for its entire length, and that makes locating it a real cinch. The dimension can be taken right off the plan. And you'll see in a second here this 148th scale whaleboat. I've got the risers and a couple of the ceiling planks in, along with some other details, but don't worry about that. In most examples of whaleboats that I've seen, the ceilings run from the ends of the head sheets to the stern sheets in one continuous piece and then there are separate shorter pieces installed 
from there to the far ends of the sheets. In this photo, you can see the seam right at the red arrow. And for most of the planks, I just install them full width, end to end. I don't try and taper anything until I get to the upper one or two planks. Now the first ceiling plank to go in is the one right over the keel. And I make that the same width as the keel. After that, I start with nine inch wide planks and adjust width from there as I need to. This step goes pretty quickly until you get to those one or two uppermost planks. Then you're going to have to spend some time measuring and tapering. Looking at the whole process, the first thing you need to do is cut the fullest width you'll need for your plank. Next is the length. And you can go a little bit long with this, but do try and keep it under a sixteenth of an inch because that will affect your tapers. Measuring the tapers is next. And even though you can't see me doing it here, I'm doing it pretty much the way you'd expect and the way I did it in episode six on the other planks that needed tapering. And it'll become apparent where you need to remove material as soon as you try and fit it. And once you've got the tapers cut and you've fared the tapers into the full width part of the plank, and you're satisfied with the fit, well then you can glue it in. And here I'm just doing a little more tweaking. Let's see if I've got it. Yeah, I must have it. I'm reaching for the glue. Now at this point, it's probably a good idea to do a bit of sanding. And this it's a good idea because you really need to know where the high spots and low spots are. You want to try and make the ceiling planks as fair as possible, as smooth as possible, and don't make them too lumpy because that's going to give you headaches later on. Right now the boat's empty and everything looks fine and if the ceiling planks are a little bit wavy it really doesn't matter that much. But as you try and put more and more of the whale craft and the gear and the tubs and all the other stuff that's got to go into the boat, into the boat, you're going to start running out of space if those planks are taking up more than their fair share of interior real estate. So you want to try and be careful about that, make it neat. Uh, it also counts for the appearance too. There's nothing worse than looking at planking that's been done poorly and has a lot of lumps and bumps and gaps in it. So try and keep all that to a minimum. Now if you're going along and you have some seriously stubborn spots, and I did have one or two on this boat, you can always use a scraper. And I just made a scraper from an old X-Acto blade that I put pretty much a random radius on and just made sure it had a wire edge so that I can use it like a cabinet scraper. And once it was scraped, a little final sanding, and that's basically to take care of it. Now watch carefully here because you're going to see just how well I have my sandpaper trained. Here boy. Oh yeah. Who's your daddy? Making the uh, stern sheets and head sheets is a pretty simple matter, but I thought I'd show it anyhow because uh, you might pick up a tip or a trick that I take for granted that would make your life easier. So here we go. Stern sheets were one inch pine boards, one inch thick that is. They were about 10 inches wide and in our scale that's 5 sixteenths of an inch or 0.313 thousandths. So I've got a piece of basswood here that is 32 thousandths thick by 5 sixteenths wide and that's what we need now as you can see here I've already made the stern sheets so all I have to do is make the head sheets and I've traced the outline on a piece of plain old tracing paper and there's my template so we don't need that anymore there's the template for the stern sheet let's get this out of here as well and the way these were made was that there was one board going this way, ran that way, the next board ran from 
the opposite side from the port side went that way, and then the last board, in this case, there are only three, uh, went that, this way again. So it alternated kind of like a basket weave. So all you need to do is just, for the first one, just mark out the length. Don't worry about cutting off that excess. We'll do that later. And I'm just using CA glue for this. That's all you need. Matter of fact, when you're dealing with paper, there's probably so much moisture content in either Elmer's or Carpenter's glue that it would probably kind of adversely affect the paper because it stays wet for so long. In this case, it's dry almost immediately. You don't have to worry about it. So to make the basket weave, you just lay the second piece on, overlapping the first, and you get it up to the point right there is where it has to meet at the top of its length. And Put it over the form until it lines up very nicely. And then just a pencil mark down here where it has to be cut. So we just do that over here on our little wood block. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it in a way that lets you see what I'm doing. But I'm laying the chisel on the point and the pencil mark. And I'm going to give it a back bevel, which means I'm not going to, I'm not going to cut it upright like that. I'm going to cut it like that. Let's see how I did. Oh, well, that looks pretty good. So we'll glue that one down. Glue the paper, glue the wood, doesn't really matter which. Just slide that up to the line. Press it down for a second or two. Now for the third one, all we have to do, and I might even be able to do it with my cutoff here, just put it right in there. Yeah, I can. Look at that. This one I'll just glue in, and then it's just a matter of trimming it off into the final shape. And that we're going to do with a nice sharp blade. were not they didn't they weren't a perfect triangle they didn't come to a point at the end they were squared off now you want to ed ease these edges just a little bit you don't want to destroy the, the detail but neither were they absolutely razor crisp sharp a sharp edge would split more easily and start to uh, peel back. So you just want to ease things over a little bit because that's the way it would have been on the boat. Now the other thing is that these, you'll put them on your your whaleboat model and they won't fit exactly up to the sides of the frames and nor are they supposed to. They want a drainage. So don't worry if they don't fit exact. They're not supposed to. And there you go. Stern sheets and head sheets. The joists for the head and stern sheets have been on the boat for quite a while, and now is the time to put them to use. Nothing special here, just glue, center, and press firmly until dry. Now 
uh, here I'm removing that temporary cleat that I installed when I was using the shear line template from episode was six. Anyhow, it's definitely outlived its usefulness. Now in the forwardmost part of the boat is the warp box. This is a shallow open compartment where the warp was stowed. Now if you've never heard that term before, a warp, at least in the case of our whale boat, is a length of the whale line roughly 30 feet long. Now as the whale line led aft from the line tubs, it was wrapped around the loggerhead, moved forward under the kicking strap, and from the kicking strap it was led through the bow chocks, then back into the warp box. And there it was neatly coiled up, and the bitter end was made fast to the two live irons by way of a double becket hitch. Now, here I've got to fess up to committing a real bonehead maneuver. The depth and width of the warp box need to be let in to the bow of the boat. And for some reason, that to this day, I, it's still a mystery as to why I didn't film the process, but I didn't do it. But even though you won't see me doing it, there's no great trick to it, so I'll just explain it quickly. Now, the length, width, and the depth of the box can all be gotten right off the plans. Now once you've marked that location on the interior of the hull, you can use a chisel. Better yet, use a chisel. You'll get much further. And a sharp knife to cut away the excess. Or you can opt for a Dremel with some kind of a rotary rasp or a burr to remove the material. The point of the exercise here is to remove all or nearly all of the hull wood and reveal the interior face of the shear strake from the exterior of the boat. Does anybody see the potential for unimaginable disaster here? A. Hey, no guts, no glory. But the news gets better. There are no supercritical measurements here. Most of this will be covered up by subsequent steps. The only thing that is critical is the depth you really should strive to get that right and consistent as you can because how well the next sequence of steps turns out depends on it. Now off camera I measured, cut, and fit the boards that make up the floor of the box which by the way is all we're going to be working on for the moment. We'll finish the box up when it comes time to install the bow chocks and the thigh board. Now these floorboards are supposed to be half inch cedar, so for our boat that means the 64th of an inch stock, or 16 thousandths. I'm using 18 thousandths, which is close enough not to sweat it. And after they're all glued in place, we can move on. And where might we be moving on to, you ask? The other end of the boat. Let's take a look at what goes into making a loggerhead. This is another piece of equipment specific to the whale fisheries. And like everything else, it seems, it's full of details that can be easily overlooked, but not by us. Now the dimensions are on the plans, but those only tell the beginning of the story. The loggerhead sits on top of the lion's tongue and the cutty boards at the aft end of the boat where there is a considerable amount of upward sweep. And if you don't include this factor into your layout, the resulting part will look as though it's falling forward when it's installed. In order for this part to do its job, it has to function perpendicular or nearly perpendicular to the waterline. So for our boat, that means a 10 degree backward leaning from plumb. Uh, the piece can be turned on the lathe, if you have one, or it can be carved by hand. Either way, it really doesn't take long. And though at first it might seem tedious to do it by hand, I think you actually have better control over doing it on a machine. But being a contrary individual, I did this one on the lathe. And, as you can see, it does go really quickly. 
especially at 200%. The observant ones out there will have noticed that prior to my turning, I cut my angles into the top and into the flange at the bottom, and both the flange and the tapered tail are left oversized for fine tuning once the major shaping is finished, but more on that in just a minute. So far we've been dealing with what's above the cutty boards. Below, it's another story. The loggerhead is about seven inches in diameter. Below the boards, you have to reduce that to about a scant four inches, and, an, and you have to taper it down to about two inches at the bottom. Oh, did I mention it also has to be square in section? <laughs> You've been looking at a photo of an older whaleboat at Mystic Seaport that clearly shows that four-sided taper. This one looks a bit on the weenie side to me, and our plans call for a section just under four inches. That doesn't look like four inches, but that's okay. I'm going with the plans here. Now, it, there's also a fid that is fitted underneath the cutty boards, and that fid holds the loggerhead in full contact with the boards and the, and the lion's tongue. Now, I didn't see that on this one, but that doesn't mean it isn't there. Uh, I really just didn't look when I took the photo. In any event, here's the one we made for our boat. I still have to make that little frame at the bottom that keeps the bottom of the taper in its place on the ceilings. Some time ago, someone had asked a question of me, what was the purpose of the lion's tongue? And I have to say, when he wrote and asked me that question, I was like, geez, what is the purpose of the lion's tongue? I couldn't, I didn't have a good answer for it. But I thought about it, and I thought about the construction of the boat. Here's the lion's tongue looking down from above, and you see the loggerhead goes right through it. And this attaches both to the stern post and all the cutty boards. And then it has the loggerhead running through it. And if you look down here in the profile, you can see that the loggerhead, the part that projects down below into the boat, is actually a four-sided taper. And it has, it also has, you can barely see it on the drawing but it actually has a fid and a mortise. Now, here's where the lion's tongue comes in. The cutty boards are just a series of boards that are nailed directly into the railings of the boat. They're not clench nailed, they're nailed straight in. So it's just wrought nails hammered right in. And that's all they've got holding those cutty, board, those cutty boards to the boat. The loggerhead received the brunt of all of the pressure from the whale line when it was attached to the whale. The whale was moving through the water at nearly anywhere from 15 to 20 miles an hour. So you've got 80,000 tons drawing you through the water at about 15 knots or so, and all of that pressure is centered right on that. But if you look at the lion's tongue, it connects all six boards to the boat and to the loggerhead. So instead of just having one inch of a board that was only held in with a few nails on each side, you've now got six boards and it's not only one inch thick, it's two inches thick. So that added a lot of strength. So the short answer is it was there for strength. Now there's no special technique involved in making this part. It's done probably just the way you'd expect. You trace the outline on a piece of one thirty-second inch stock, you cut it out, and you refine the shape. Now you probably have to do some tweaking and a small bit of altering or lengthening or shortening here or there to get the proper fit for your particular model. So go slowly. This is a small part and one too many strokes with the file and all your nice hard work will go right into the trash. Now fitting the lion's tongue and the logger head are two places where I always go very slowly, contrary to the way it looks on the screen. There it is, all done and in place. 
And I think this is a good place to end this episode. We've covered a lot of ground, and this thing's starting to really look like a whaleboat. For episode eight, we'll continue on with the interior details, and we'll cover locating the centerboard case and the mast step. Maybe we'll even have time to go over the thwarts. Like almost everything else on a whaleboat, they're more complicated than you think. Should be fun. So remember to hit those buttons for me, please and thank you. And until I see you again next time, stay well, stay strong, treat each other nicely. Now, break's over. Get back in the shop.